Hi, Tomodachi. Welcome back to the Tokyo Show with your host, Nicholas Pettis. Today, we are doing Chapter 5 of The Blue-Eyed Samurai. So, last time, um, we spoke a little bit about how my training started. And um, there was this uh, specific incident in the dojo where I had kicked one of my senpais in the face. And he had turned around and, like, checked his lip um, to see what was going on there in the mirror. And um, at the time, I didn't know what the effect of this was. But uh, for Judd, it was just like he was furiated with it. And uh, so they were in the same year, Judd and, and Ligo. And uh, me being a Kohai, the fact that you I kicked my, one of my senpais in the head, well, that's a big no-no in the beginning for one thing. Uh, the second thing is that, um, that Ligo turned away from me. And then, so it's like Judd was like on a mission to like just completely destroy me after that because he just needed to show that who was the senpai in the, in the dormitory. And uh, fair enough. I mean, uh, I didn't really think much about it. I mean, if you get kicked in the face and you think you got a cut lip, uh, I think I would have probably checked it myself too. But um, for Judd, it was like, it was a completely different level. Um, I think eventually I would uh, get to the level where Judd was and like understand why this was such a bad thing. Um, but at the time, I thought it was just uh, a really um, yeah, funny incident. But man... He spent uh, days and days and, and, and carrying a grudge on this. I think uh, if you ask him even today, he might have a grudge on it. Anyway, let's dive in to chapter five. Who's who in the dorm? Um, so the next few days, I forced myself to do the same training. And by doing that, I was able to overcome the pain uh, in my leg somewhat. My first dinner with Sosai was supposed to be on the first Saturday evening after about three days in the dorm. And so it turned out that Sosai had some other engagement and wasn't able to attend the weekly dinner in the dorm. <gasps> oh, thank God for that. Those dinners. I'll get to that whenever. Anyway, uh, so we ended up stuffing ourselves with all the chicken soup and deep fried pork chops, which I found excellent. Yeah, the tonkatsu is really good, actually. After a really good and quite relaxed dinner with lots of talking, uh, that is talking amongst my senpai because the first year students were not allowed to talk unless spoken to, we all went down to the local bathhouse. Yes, this is actually something called a sento. Um, it's like two, three hundred yen, maybe three, four dollars to get in. And then you share like a, a bathhouse. It's, uh, it's really relaxing, actually. Um, we uh, could go once a week provided that we were accompan accompanied by a senpai. I didn't really see the great thing about being able to go to a bathhouse, but was quite excited about getting out of the big room for a change. Whilst walking down the streets around the Dikyo University, uh, Mokoram told me that Kyokushin had actually really started inside the university. Yeah, in a ballet classroom, and it was right in there. So I was walking right through the middle of, of history of Kyokushin once again. Yeah, I was beginning my own history and like walking through history, it, there was like so many mixed emotions going on there. Anyway, now the bathhouse really proved to be a pleasant surprise. It was a bathhouse with all kinds of different bubble baths with funny colors and herbs and hot waters. There were bubbles like small bubbles and big bubbles. There was steaming hot waters. Uh, it was just like something I'd never experienced before. It was really cool, actually. Uh, being in Japan, there are certain rules which you have to follow. You can't just walk in and jump into the tub, and which you find the most interesting. Um, you have to wash yourself down first and then rinse properly. Uh, this is etiquette, of course. I mean, you don't want to be a dirty body going into the water that everyone else is sharing. So... It was all uh, done out of respect for the other people who would be using the same baths. It was all new to me, and I tried out of the, uh, and I tried out the body scrub for the first time, and I felt clean. Like uh, I don't know how to explain this. It's like when you when you have this body scrub down, and then you uh, wash yourself and rinse everything off, and then you take a hot bath, and then a cold bath, and then a hot bath, and a cold bath. By the time you walk out of these bathhouses, you feel like a million dollars. Like all the pain that your body had is gone. It is an amazing feeling. I really like, I felt like a new man. Then it was time to get into the bath when I said before it was steaming hot. And I really meant it. Like some of these baths are like 40, I think 44 degrees. It's like almost scalingly hot. Yeah. So, um, the trick for someone like us who hasn't grown up with the bathhouses is that you could get into the cold one first and like really chill your body down and then go into the hot one. And then you can kind of switch back and forth. Um, but yeah, they're really, really cool. Uh, Sunday mornings are a bit different than other mornings. And although everyone still got up for morning training, I could feel that it was a Sunday. The daily routine goes on and there's um, a morning class uh, like all the other days. But in the afternoon, Sosai would teach a special black belt class which I could not attend as I had decided uh, to start over as a white belt when I went to Japan. So yeah, 
I, um, I was a first Q uh, brown belt, like one uh, level before black belt in Denmark um, when I went to Japan, but I had to start over as a white belt because um, that's what the old the Japanese uchideshi do and, and that's what I would be doing. Um, where were we? Uh, I thought that it would be the... Ja yeah, so I thought that's what the Japanese students would do and therefore it was the only choice for me to do it. And as a wise man once told me, in order to learn something new, you must throw away everything you think you know and then start over and really it was something like that it was uh walking into the karate uh, kyokushin hombu and like trying to learn the new way from zero from scratch and that means i had to also obviously line up in the back where everyone else is all the white belts anyway feeling like a million dollars after the bath i decided to join the morning class otherwise i would not know what to i was going to do with myself for the rest of the day i lined up like everyone else right at the back uh, amongst all the other white bills who were real beginners but it didn't feel wrong i came with an open mind and an open heart and really enjoyed just being able to join in a class and not having to worry about uh, anything like being in front of everyone and being like the leadership so it's like just starting over and enjoying karate uh, with no pressure at all it was really cool um, back home in Denmark, I was always up front and being quite technically advanced, was always called upon to demonstrate things and I was asked to teach the kids class after only a year and a half, which I also wrote earlier and that would pay for my uh, training fees back home. Uh, I was quite technically um, good actually. I mean, I'm not saying, sitting here and bragging about it, but I loved skill, I loved technique and I loved practicing uh, technique. Um, so I was uh, really um, at a really high level, at a black belt level at this time actually. Anyway, there I was standing amongst the other white bills, being far superior in technique, but having a great time. After the usual kihon, we moved on to the Ido Geiko, and whilst we were doing this, I started to feel a little bit threatened by the guys that were training beside me. They were not able to control their movements quite so precisely and kept getting closer and closer to hitting me. I tried compensating, but there were a lot of students in the class and space was not on our side. It really wasn't. It was a packed class and there were all kicks flying all over the place. So during the kicking, the inevitable happened. The guy kicking beside me was so out of rhythm with everyone else that his and my foot clashed together. Oh man, this is not pretty. And it was quite painful, so I had to step out of class to check it, literally. I was in so much pain that I couldn't even stand on my foot. Unfortunately, I knew that there was something wrong. Yep, this is like the second or third class in Japan, by the way. And I looked at the toe and it was com turning completely black with internal bleeding. I didn't know it at the time, but it had, but I had just fractured my toe. Yep, first broken bone within a week in Japan. Very good job done. <laughs> I was escorted downstairs. We suspected it was broken. I was told to go to hospital and get it checked. Sosai happened to be out of town that day and the Uchideshi who always drove Sosai around was free and also had access to Sosai's car. So I got lucky and was driven to a hospital in Sosai's car. It's true. This is also be supposed to be a big secret, of course, because uh, it was the secretary who worked in the office who told the driver to take me to the hospital in Sosai's car. Well, I guess I won't get in trouble for telling anyone today. <laughs> it was a really nice car. A Nissan President car, by the way. Yeah. Uh, the kind of car you dream about when you're a kid. Beautiful leather seats and perfect air conditioning. I loved it. Sitting there in the back of Sosai's car driving through Tokyo was like doing sightseeing for first class. And what a city it is. So big and so complex. Small streets all over the place leading down to places I couldn't even imagine existed. The driver uh, being used to the streets in Tokyo took me down these narrow streets and I was sure he was going to crash the car or at least scratch it. But nope. Even where it seemed impossible for the car to pass, we somehow managed to get through without any scratches at all. If you have never driven around in a car in Tokyo, I don't know how to explain it. It is insane. Like There are some of the back streets where you think you'll never get out of there and then you can just get through. Uh, I actually drove Escalade for many, many years. and uh, So I got used to driving a really big car on really small narrow streets here. It was amazing in itself. I can't remember how long we drove, but after some time, just about long enough for me to forget about my toe, we arrived at the hospital and I was woken up of my dream world and faced with the reality of my foot. I couldn't really walk by myself, so I got some assistance from my senpai and we made our way to the front desk. Now, he didn't speak much English uh, other than something like, this is a pen, uh, so that didn't help me very much. However, the lady at the reception was very friendly and somehow we got through the papers and I was told to wait until they called my name. 
The doctor was a very small man, full of energy and old, like very old. Like he looked like Master Yoda or something. He was so cute. Uh, the kind of old that makes you wonder <laughs> how old he really is. Yeah, that's so true. He was quite excited to see me and even spoke a few words of English. He asked me what, what was wrong. And when he saw the foot, he sent me to, straight to the x-ray. When he called me back, he asked me where I was from. And I told him I'm from Denmark. And then he got super excited. He's like, oh my God. My old uh, tens, uh, teacher in medical school was a Danish man. And I feel like I need to repay this debt. So uh, I don't want you to pay any money for the treatment I'm giving you here. <laughs> that was cool. Yeah. So I got free treatment for that just for being Danish. That's so amazing. Like this hospitality thing called omotenashi in Japanese is really like something uh, to look forward to. So I was in good hands. And he even refused to take any money from me and told me to come back anytime if I ever had anything wrong with me. I ended up with a pair of crutches and a steel cast around my toe. It hurt like hell, but I guess that's the only way he knew how to fix it. The ride back home was not as exciting as going uh, out, although the air conditioner was nice. That's true. That air conditioner was so cool. I could not stop thinking about how I was going to tell Sosa what had happened and that I would not be able to train for quite some time. I felt really, really bad. We hadn't even had the initial ceremony and the other first year students hadn't even arrived yet. Now here I was ahead of everybody else, already injured and not able to do anything. It's pretty frustrating. It was like really frustrating. When I got back to the dorm, Judd and Ligo were still sleeping and I didn't know what had happened. So I woke them up uh, and they didn't know what had happened. So I woke them up and to, to quite a surprise. Normally on Sundays, everyone would, everyone would try and get some extra sleep at least uh, until Soul Size class started at three, three o'clock. Uh, by then, uh, everyone would be back in the dogi and doing ki eyes. They looked at me and just laughed. I think Mokoram said something like, Man, you're lucky. This means you don't get up for morning training. I would have traded morning training any day for this injury. But of course, I didn't say as much as that. We were all still at the stage where we didn't really know each other and how we thought or reacted to given situations. But we were in the process of finding out just exactly where our boundaries were. Mokoram would prefer not to train. I wanted to train. Like, really, really wanted to train. At the end of the day, we were all rivals, and rivals need to know their position, not just one that the system has forced upon you, but the true position which have, has to be won by fighting for it. Eh, that's what Judd taught me. So I was still trying to work out whom I could trust and whom I could not. My Danish teacher's final words had been, do as the Japanese do and not as the other foreigners and you will be all right. The next morning I got up like everyone else and made my way over to the dojo where I did what I could to join in. Although everything was a bit awkward with the crutches, I sort of managed to ride the stationary bike instead of running. I couldn't skip, but I did my push-ups and sort of half squatted while everyone else was working out. I did everything I could to keep up. Although it was hard work, I knew it was the right thing to do. I'd made up my mind and I knew that I needed to trust in myself and try to do things the way I felt it right in my heart. It would have been easier to just quit and stay back in a dorm and sleep. Uh, but I had not come here to sleep. I knew that I needed to do things right. And it felt like doing, um, it was a bit like doing my homework at the library back in Denmark, in a place where I could focus in order to get the job done right the first time instead of having to deal with it later. So even with a broken foot, I would get up early in the morning and uh, simulate some kind of morning training um, instead of just lying in bed like Mukaram had suggested. The days went by and before I knew it, the new boys started arriving. The first to arrive was an Australian guy called Todd. He had come in a few, day, a few days before the Japanese and he smelled like trouble from the first time he set foot in the dorm. He was one of those foreigners who had spent some time in Japan and thought he knew his way around the scene. He also happened to be a bit older than everyone else. At 22, he was considered old. <laughs> at 22, yeah. Well, at four years older than me. I was 18. Um, that is how young we all were. Not even 20. Yeah, in Japan, that is considered grown up yet. Uh, that is considered grown up. But we all had our own minds and hearts and uh, full of desire to become something more than the average kid growing up. Well, Todd, uh, Todd changed the whole atmosphere in the dorm. When he was around, you never knew what, he would, what would happen. He would say stuff like, I'm going to knock him out or I'll knock you out if you don't do as I say. Uh, and that was just like not really the uh, attitude that we were looking for in first year students. Like, you know, we're supposed to be humble and all we're supposed to say is us to everything. And he'd be like, you know, running around going, I'm going to knock him out, man. I'm going to take that senpai out. Uh, so he was, a, he was a, a feisty character to say it in the least. Um, I just didn't see him lasting very long, but uh, let's uh, see how it goes. It was the first time for me to see how little the Japanese actually understand the foreigners because his attitude didn't get dealt with and his manners didn't get corrected. I was shocked to see that nothing was actually done about his obnoxious Westerner uh, attitude and until I realized how deep the rabbit hole actually went. 
They did not consider us as equals or even consider us as able to understand the actual way of the Budo spirit. It burned in their hearts that we were a bunch of non-Japanese that could arrive in Japan and do whatever we wanted and actually think that we could do, get the same respect. Um, this needs to be explained in a little bit uh, deeper uh, context here. So uh, back in the day when I first started and, and, and that time uh, at Hombu, uh, foreigners were just considered as foreigners. And, and that's all they really saw us as. Is, oh, they're just foreigners. So don't worry about it. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do that and stuff like that. But I decided I wanted to do everything that the Japanese did um, and enable to get the same respect. Um, I'll get to that in, in, a, in a bit, but um, they wouldn't call us senpai even if we had black belts. They would call us uh, uh, san, uh, just as, as in Mr. Whoever it was. Even my Shihan Boots wouldn't be called Shihan, he would be called Boots san. So just Mr. Boots. But I mean, he's a, a fifth dan in, in karate and has been doing it for over 30 years. It's like, why would he not uh, get the same respect as the Japanese Shihans get? You know, a Shihan is a Shihan. So um, I uh, actually made it a mission to change that system and made, uh, once I got a black belt, I got all the, uh, the Japanese kohai to call me senpai. And uh, I think things uh, really at Hombu changed after that. Uh, in Japan, it is considered very honorable to stick to the goals that you have either set for yourself or that have been imposed, um, impo imposed upon you. Todd was not the kind of guy to stick to anything other than what he thought was right. He didn't see anyone as his senpai and there was no way in hell he would do as he was told, unless he actually thought you were stronger than him. He was a skinny boy with a couple of street fights under his belt, but he was not a fighter. I was even skinnier than him and not in a position to try to tell him what to do, but respected Judd because he knew that Judd was stronger than him. So Ligo, being the smartest of them all, figured out <laughs> straight away it was best left to Judd to tell him what to do. The only problem here was most of the time Judd didn't care uh, up to telling him what to do. As long as he could do his weights and knock some white belts out in class, he was pretty much happy. <laughs> okay, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but Judd really just cared about his own training more than anything else. Uh, Judd, uh, no, Todd. Todd thought that he could come in and make his own rules, and in the beginning, he sort of got away with it, but only because no one actually knew what to do with this renegade foreigner. Ligo knew that it was their job as senpai to tell him what to do and get things right and started to educate him. Let me rephrase that. He started to try to educate him in a way, in the ways of the dorm. He didn't take a liking to the things he was told to do and could see all that he, this was just heading for trouble. Although Judd did try to warn him about it, uh, he was convinced that anyone uh, tried anything funny, he would be able to fight his way out of it. So there you have it. He needed to be disciplined in the old-fashioned way, and the only way was, and the only one for the job was Judd. So after that, uh, he stayed out of Judd's way. But when me and my broken toe, there was no respect or even common sense. He would talk the talk, and I would let him because I couldn't do much about it, uh, and I couldn't even spar with him. So though, you know. I wouldn't have a chance to kick him in the head. I was pretty convinced even then, although I had a broken foot, that um, if I hadn't had a broken foot, that I would be able to be better than him in the dojo because I could just see from the way he moved that um, he wouldn't be a, a problem for me. But I never got the chance. And he was just always like bullying, uh, like especially me around because I had a broken toe. It was just really annoying, actually. Super frustrating to be in a room that where you are not getting along with a person that, you know, you have to like, you know, just, you know, bite down and, and shut, shut up, you know. Now, Todd's case was a bit different from everybody else's. He'd been introduced to Sosai by one of the branch chiefs of, of Australia, and he didn't have enough money to pay for his stay. Sosai had actually given him, given him a job at the, in the office from 9 to 12, every day so that he could pay for his fees. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit later on what, what he did at that office job, but I mean, I felt it was completely not fair um, because we had to save up money to come and do it, and he was given a job. This is actually just like the good kind-heartedness of Sosai. Anyway, the day before the official initial ceremony of the Japanese students uh, started arriving, there were four of them. I had already been there for more than three weeks and had settled in. I already had my own corner of the dorm, but I knew how these new guys felt. Just seeing their faces, I felt sorry for them. I wish I could have told them that everything was going to be all right, but I knew it wasn't going to be all right. So even if I could have, it would have been pointless. Thinking back now, the only one I really seemed to have uh, the right kind of air about him was Mahashi. Uh, Mahasan was the one that stayed with me until the end, by the way. I can't even remember two of the guys' names, but there was one guy, I remember, he was a big boy, nice, dark, complex face, and he was the oldest. I thought we might make a good team, um, actually. He seemed really, really, really nice. In the evening on their first day of the dorm, the senpai took all the new boys out to the barber, and they all came back with shaved heads. I had already done this the first day I moved in, and since then I'd kept it really short, about two millimeters. Seeing them all like that was good. It felt us like feel like we were a little team, a little bit closer, you know, although we didn't speak a word of any communication, actually. 
Todd didn't even want to talk to them. He would rather try and suck up to his new idol Judd. So I found myself trying to blend in with these new boys whom I couldn't even talk to. We started to look for other ways to communicate and this communication started out or turned out to be in a form of who could do more push-ups. Yes, we were doing it. Sets of 50 push-ups or trying to figure out who could do the most. I guess we had to figure out who was the strongest amongst ourselves. Push-ups was never my thing, so I lost easily. But when it came to sit-ups, I could beat them all. Then we did arm wrestling. And in this, Mahashi beat everyone, even me. He was really good at arm wrestling, actually. <laughs> he was a tall, skinny boy with a silent kind of confidence about him. And he started uh, trying to teach me some Japanese words so that we could start communicating. He would turn out to be my best friend in the dorm. The next day at noon, uh, we had the ceremony with Sosai and everyone had, uh, was sworn in and promised to do their best not to fail and try to train hard and become as strong as possible. Uh, it was during, I was uh, doing the ceremony on the crutches and tried to avoid Sosai's scrutinizing looks. It felt pretty intense when he was looking at you because I had a broken toe. He didn't ask me anything what had happened, but I figured that he already knew. Um, so he just let me do, uh, just let me stand there and, uh, you know, tag along on this opening ceremony. Anyway, at the time, there was an English-speaking secretary who was kind enough to translate what Sosai was saying to us, so I more or less knew what was going on. However, it was the knowledge that Sosai was actually speaking to us uh, directly and the will to want to understand this firsthand that drove me to learn Japanese. Out of the foreigners living in a dorm at the time, Mokoram was by far the best speaker, but he was too stuck up to want to teach anything to us. However, I learned a lot from listening to him talk because he spoke very distinctively and was easy to follow for some reason. So even if he didn't teach, want me to teach, uh, want to teach me, I still learned a lot from him. Ligo, on the other hand, was the kind of guy who would like to study and like to try and teach both Todd and me. I'd always had a good ear for learning languages, and Japanese is not that hard to pick up. And so I started picking up a lot over the first couple of months. Todd, on the other hand, thinking he knew stuff already, kept insulting everyone with his rude manner of speech. In the beginning, all I could do was get up in the morning and do the morning training, and then attend the morning ceremony where Sosai could talk to us. I would get this translated and try to understand it. Uh, after that, there was the cleaning of the big room, and then I had nothing else to do to study but study Japanese and talk to whoever was around. So it was actually kind of a good thing that I got a, a, a chance to really like just like focus on studying Japanese for a while. Anyway, I found myself feeling very lonely and out of place because I couldn't train the way I had come half across the world to do. On top of this, within the first week, uh, two of the new Uchideshi had already dropped out, sneaking out during the middle of the night from what and why still eludes me. I guess they really missed their families or their girlfriends. One of them had shown me a picture of his girlfriend on the first day when we had done our push-up contest. I think he was in love. Mahashi always seemed calm and cool, just doing what he was being told to and doing it really well. Maybe the morning training was too hard. I was told they were running the hill every day and try to break the new boys. Well, it was working because two of them had already quit. Yeah, they went fast. Todd was working in the office every day, starting getting a big head about being so close to Solsai. One day after coming back from work, and having eaten his lunch, he took out his futon and said he was tired from work and was going to sleep in his bed like everyone else. This was not allowed for first-year students. It was a big no-no. We were not even allowed to lie down in the big room. We had to fold up our beds and put them away in the morning and were not allowed to take them out during the daytime. In fact, we were not allowed to sleep during the day at all. But Todd knew better. Uh, <laughs> Todd knew better. By this time, I had just gotten rid of my crutches and had just started to walk uh, without them. I knew if Mahashi uh, didn't take his bed out, I would not either. Despite a warning from Judd, he took his bed out, uh, futon in the afternoon, to lie down and sleep. I hadn't liked the guy from the first moment he had walked in the door, and now I just hoped he got what was coming to him. I sat there watching Todd wrap himself up in his blanket, thinking that he was that he, <laughs> he had his job here so that he could pay for his fees. That was just really nagging at me. Um, <clears throat> because he was working... Uh, he doesn't have to do all the cleaning that me and Mahashi were doing. So another thing, right? He was just doing something in the office, you know, that, you know, he was getting paid for. And we were doing all the chores. And it was actually not fair at all. Hmm. Mahashi and I had to do uh, uh, all the other stuff. Lobby business that Mahashi is forced to do. And then he considers himself to be part of us. How in his wildest imagination does he get the idea that he is more tired than any of us and that he could just take out his bed and sleep? Mahashi has to stand in the lobby on guard for more than six hours a day, not able to move until told to, and then at a run. I sat there thinking of all these things I, I should say to him and all the things that I wanted to do to him. When in came Ligo, our senpai, the first thing he did when he saw him lying on the futon was run over and kick him as hard as he could right up his ass. <laughs> yeah, man, you fucking deserved that one. 
Anyway, I'd been praying for something like this to happen. Well, knowing Todd, this was not going to go unanswered. Like a bat out of hell, he shot up and out of bed and started mouthing off at Ligo, telling that he deserved to sleep since he was working all morning and blah, 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 blah. Ligo told him that he had to do jumping squats as a punishment for being rude, but Dodd told him to get fucked and that he would knock him out if he didn't shut up. Todd liked to threaten people with knocking them out. I wanted to knock him out. Well, this kind of behavior from a junior is not acceptable, and so Ligo told him to get his ass up in the dojo where they would settle this the good old-fashioned way. So we all got up and started to make our way to the dojo, but by the time we got to the street, Ligo jumped Todd and then started beating the crap out of each other. It wasn't as exciting as I had hoped for because no one got knocked out. <laughs> yeah, they just kind of rolled around and wrestled for a while, and then you know, Minami Senpai came over to the rescue and quickly uh, broke it up. I was hoping for something more, you know, exciting, maybe for Todd to get expelled or something like that, but because um, I was really just tired of him. Uh, his behavior uh, reflected badly on all the foreigners, and uh, many of the Japanese saw us just as all the same. So by acting this day, would never give us the respect that we should have, have been worthy of if we, uh, you know, did things the right way. Uh, at the time, uh, there had never been a foreign student to complete the three years and receive the final award as a graduated, uh, true graduated Uchideshi of Mastatsu Oyama. No foreigner had ever gone from the beginning to the end like the Japanese. I wanted to do this more than anything else. So I kept to the rules and behaved the way I saw Mahashi behaving. I made sure that they didn't have any reason to get angry with me. I made sure that the jobs I was assigned to were done properly. I even requested to do lobby duties even though I couldn't speak Japanese or pick up the phone. I just wanted to stand there with Mahashi-san. Just because I knew he was doing it, so I did it too. I assigned my own times in the lobby and other duties such as cleaning the dojo every morning. I was uh, so unlucky on my first time back in training after being able to walk again. I was sparring with one of my senpai when I kicked him with a front kick um, right up his shin. <laughs> Listen to this story. Yeah, so I finally got back to training and I finally joined in in a class. And then I got through all the kihon. I got through all the basics and everything. And then they were sparring at the end. And I threw a front kick and then I literally broke another toe. Yeah, on my left foot. And this time, it's not on the, so the first time I broke it was left foot and then the second time on the right foot. So I had like two broken uh, toes like within the first month I was in Japan. Straight back to the same old doctor, uh, Master Yoda. <laughs> and he's like, hey, don't worry about it. You know, you don't have to pay for this one. It started to be like a, a little bit embarrassed to go there though. Anyway, this is about mu as far as we're going to get in the book today. Um, I hope you're enjoying the uh, Blue-Eyed Samurai uh, editor's cut here with Nicholas Pettis. Um, we'll keep on until the book is done. And then if you have any questions uh, during the, the show, you're always welcome to leave comments below. Thank you very much for watching today. <laughs>